Hey guys, I know it's been a minute, and I know you guys are probably tired of hearing me say that at the beginning of every video, but anyhow, today I wanted to talk about a few super warm myths that I have been asked about about a million times, and have seen a lot of misinformation about. So today, we are going to tackle, do super worms bite or sting, and we are going to go over a little bit about the behavior that looks like aggression. But first, I have a Facebook group that is slowly growing, and from time to time, we do do giveaways. Casey's Mealworm Superworm and Discoid Roach Knowledge Center on Facebook. And with that out of the way, let's get on with the video. So first things first, let's talk a little bit about a Superworm's anatomy. They have six legs up front and two spurs at their rear. The spurs are used for locomotion, be it forward or backward, and can be used for digging. See here when we disturb the Superworm, how it begins to move itself backwards. These are the spurs primary function in action. Let's take a second to actually look at the spurs. They are very small and almost bendy. The reason I started here is to eliminate the myth of them stinging. They don't have a stinger. When a superworm is picked up, it will do a rolling circular motion, and this is to help free themselves from a predator. They are also swinging their rears to use their spurs as hooks to help free themselves and gain leverage. They have one last defense, which is a secretion they produce that has a musky, almost chemical smell to it. It most likely also acts as a lubrication to help the worm get itself free but this is purely speculation. Now, on to biting. Superworms can bite. Nearly anything with a mouth can bite. However, I have heard a lot online about how bad superworm bites hurt and how scary they are because of it. This is simply false. Superworms do have intimidating mouth parts, but they simply lack the strength to do any real damage. You can see here, I am making this superworm bite my thumb by holding it down and applying pressure to the insect. You can see it tear the very top layer of skin on my thumb. My hands are very soft and devoid of calluses. Up until this point where I tried to make one bite me, I didn't believe their mouth parts were strong enough to realistically even bite us. So, they technically can tear skin. However, their bite is less than a singular ant sting, and I've had my hands covered in these guys before. If they have been biting me this whole time, I've never felt it. One of the sources I found for superworm bites, at least from somewhere you would expect good information to come from, was Fluker's Farms. Their care sheet states both missed covered in this video. This is why I test everything myself, and I encourage you to test what I say. See for yourself. This is the entire basis of my channel. Let's cover one last topic before we end the video. Superworms biting pets. While it is possible, since they have mouths and can bite us, they could bite your pet. However, the likelihood of it is next to none. If you are feeding large superworm larvae, and say one escapes from the food dish, that superworm isn't going to get hungry enough to bite your pet. It's not going to get thirsty enough to bite your pet either. Superworms can go over a month without either or. What it's gonna do is go into its pupa form due to it being in isolation of other superworms. I cannot count the amount of pupa I have pulled from my leopard gecko enclosures and never has one of my animals been injured. And I have six geckos. So, again, I do find it entirely possible for superworms to bite your pets. It just is highly unlikely and isn't something you should fear. So that about wraps it up, guys. If you like this video and have it in your career loving heart, give this video a like, a subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more videos in the future like this. And as always, from the Gizzards and I, have a wonderful day.